Thank you very much. We have now uh, the luxury of about 45 minutes or so to uh, really hear from you about uh, your observations, also your questions, and a real opportunity to interact with uh, the three diverse speakers we had this morning. So Maggie, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Elizabeth. Somebody has to start, and I hope this will make the kids in the room in particular feel uh, the, the, they've got the courage to get up and ask a question, because this is a great opportunity. A very, very short comment first. I have rarely enjoyed so much listening to three people for the time that it took in our plenary presentation. So I congratulate all of you, and I'd love to ask a question to each, but I'm not going to. I'm going to ask a question of Jeff. Jeff, IBM has decided to finance a study on, and I'm not even sure whether it's the cost, the value, or the price of water, and to set up a template uh, for this that could be usable by communities, entities all around the world. Uh, I presume everybody in this room knows that one of the major problems, and uh, one of Carl's sh slides showed this so dynamically about the farmer standing in the field, in a field of water for which he has not paid, pumped with electricity for which he has not paid, uh, and the fact that we don't have adequate water pricing around the world, and so therefore this leads to all sorts of distortions in allocation and use. Could you talk a little bit about this study uh, how it's being done, uh, what it's designed to get at. Is, is this going to be something that helps us uh, ascribe cost valuation of water in communities around the world? And uh, what's happening? When will it be out and all the rest of it? Because it sounds like the answer to a maiden's prayer. So uh, <laughs> this maiden hopes so. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the question. I'll, am I mic here? Sure. You guys can hear me? Um, so a little disclaimer, of course, it's such a big company, I'm not always aware of all the studies that are going on, and I have to admit, I'm not sure if it's the study you're referring to or the Water Fund partnership that um, was recently announced. Uh, maybe I could just ask you to nod or no, Water Fund? Yeah, yeah. I think it, is. it was announced about four or five weeks ago, longer mm -hmm. than that. Yeah. So I believe it's the Water Fund one, which was announced about six weeks ago, where um, we are applying uh, analytical and optimization capabilities to, um, I forget the gentleman's name, who is the CEO of this, of this organization, and it is around the cost of producing water. And what it's trying to do is reconcile, kind of by looking at global instances of, of um, unsubsidized water to try and get a like-for-like like measure. The algorithm and uh, the basis for the calculations are not proprietary to IBM, it's this other, this other company, Water Fund. Uh, but there's an enormous amount of data and variables and part of the, um, the power of analytics, uh, you know, modern day analytical tools and techniques is to be able to take highly dynamic and uh, differing data structures and kind of boil them down and reconcile them. And so it's an attempt to quantify, indeed. IBM, of course, is nonpartisan and, and has, is not going to issue a statement on what's, what's the cost of a, of a cubic meter of water or something. But the, this, this particular algorithm, plus the capability for us to process and mine vast amounts of data will help in the pursuit of quantifying uh, water. And I believe it'll be, I'm sure it'll be an iterative process uh, but it's a great, uh, a great first step. And uh, when, you, when you put forward an example of technology bringing in lots of data and lots of perspectives like that, then it kind of has a snowball effect, and so more people will be adding to that and adding to that. So I doubt it'll be a, a silver bullet in the next uh, six months to a year. I'm not sure really, uh, again, to your comment about a study and if there will be a report based on that. I'll have to get back to you on whether or not IBM will be issuing uh, results, so to speak, but I expect it to be a kind of ongoing evolution of a tool. And there's many, many tools like this. Uh, and probably the Water Fund one is not the only one that, that we will be involved in, in in the near future. Again, it's taking other people's kind of proprietary subject matter insights, subject matter expertise and insights into things like cost and value and uh, crunching down the data so that you get a, 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 more, um, a more validated uh, response or outcome. I hope that answers your question to some extent. Thank you. 
down the middle. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Campana. I'm a professor at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, although uh, if I had my druthers, I'd make my living tweeting and blogging as water-wired, as some of you know. Um, and I have to say, I, I find the weather quite refreshing. It's better than getting dumped on with a meter of rain, as, as we are this time of year. My, my question was for, was for Minister Miltenberger, and uh, coming from the Western United States, a lot of us have attitudes towards our federal government that you have, at least I perceive, that you have towards your federal government. And so a lot of what you said made sense to me, and I was actually really fascinated by your whole talk and all the goings on in the Northwest Territories. But what really knocked me for a loop, and I would never hear this from one of my colleagues from Wyoming or Utah, is I believe at the end, and I had to write this down, that um, you, you kind of put out a call for a national water strategy and that there'd be a careful role for the federal government. And I was floored by that. And I was just curious, what, what do you see a national water strategy envisioning and what's the careful role for your federal government? The, uh, clearly, there, there's a role for the federal government in something, the, the water in the, our country is unmapped, that the, the federal government used to have a fairly significant role, which they've uh, left the field on due to budget cuts and change of priorities. So we don't understand as a country the, what's happening with groundwater, that these basins and everything we do is linked. It's tied to energy. It's tied to the survival of the country, literally, how we manage our water. And if we leave the leave it to 13 jurisdictions, then you end up with a, a patchwork. And something as big as energy and as big as water, there, there is a role and a need, a unifying role to, for the federal government to bring parties to the table, like we did with health care, like we've done with other critical issues, to have the discussion about how we share our resources, how do we over, provide that oversight, how do we get all the work done to understand the various water systems. I was at a conference in Canmore I think there's one station left in the mountains that does all the, all the checking on things that are happening with ice and snow and snowpack. In Europe, they'd, in a similar area, they'd have hundreds. So we've, uh, we've limited ourselves at a time when the need has never been greater with global warming, uh, adapting to climate change, mitigating climate change. You can't do that individually, even though I will say the best work is being done on climate change adaptation and mitigation by communities provinces and territories, because the federal government has told us they will not lead. Uh, so there is, it, it's a critical issue, and I mean, civilizations have come and gone because they didn't handle this issue of water properly, and I think there is a role for the federal government. Thank you. Over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Stephen Liss, I'm a professor at uh, Queen's University. Uh, my question is to uh, Minister Miltenberger. Uh, reflecting on the other panelists' comments this morning about data, uh, I was wondering how important uh, data and the availability of the appropriate digital infrastructure might be to NWT's uh, uh, goals and aspirations for uh, resource management and uh, water protection and uh, conservation. It's, I mean, information is going to be critical and as you look at the map of the Northwest Territories, I was talking about this, the oil play in the central Mackenzie, for example, there's uh, very, very little known about the groundwater in that part of the country, in the whole Northwest Territories actually, there's a minimal amount known. So as we go into things like hydraulic fracturing, it's a very, very big issue because the people there, the Aboriginal government and the folks in the communities want to know, they've seen and heard everything about fracturing and it causes them great concern. We don't know a lot about that. The being able to move and having the technology to move is something we're going to address because we're in the process of putting a fiber optic line from a Nuvik, which will become second only to Kruna, Sweden in terms of remote sensing. Uh, we're going to run a fiber optic line all the way down to Mackenzie Valley and it's going to hook in a Nuvik and every small community along the way. So we're going to have the capacity within about two years to have the cutting edge technology into the smallest of our communities, and it will be a great boon as well for doing business and being able to put that tool to work as we try to understand all the things we need to know about the water in Northwest Territories. 
Just as an aside, the, um, you may be interested, the, the council has just been given a question from the federal government relating to um, how one can use enabling and evolving uh, information and communications technologies particularly for achieving environmental objectives in this country. So look forward to uh, some interesting conversations ahead. Please. My name is David Brooks and I'm representing the International Institute for Sustainable Development here today. However, my question has nothing to do with my work with IISD. For a number of years, I have been closely involved with water, a potential water agreement between Israel and Palestine. Uh, over that work, we have come to the conclusion that water allocation is very much a secondary issue compared with the processes that lead to allocation. Uh, I think this goes along very much with the comment that it's not technology, but it's the, uh, in the institutions that lead to the technology. Uh, as you are going ahead with agreements with Alberta, with Saskatchewan, with BC, and eventually a renewed agreement with Yukon, are they allocation agreements? In other words, this much water is ours, that much water is yours? Or are they processes that lead you to reach agreement under specific circumstances, with specific amounts of water, specific qualities, and so forth? We're going to, we're going to have uh, both. I mean, we've, we've looked at uh, work around the world in terms of transboundary issues. As I indicated, we have some of the very best people, I think, in the country currently on our negotiating team. So we're going to negotiate. We're looking at thresholds. We're going to look at some flow issues. The, the, and the key, the key is, the first question is, how much does the land need to survive? That's the number one question. Forget the people, forget the businesses, as that's secondary. So we're going to come to that agreement, and we know that uh, with Alberta we're we're very we're very close in that discussion. We're going to look at uh, e integrated ecosystem management, which is going to be critical as well. And you can't look at the water separate from the land, and vice versa. So uh, the folks in Israel and Palestine they got a, ton, a very very tough job ahead of them, and centuries of history that we don't have uh, to challenge us quite yet. We have decades of history, but not quite the same as the folks in the Middle East. Where, and I looked at the River Jordan, pictures of it a, a few years ago and what it looks like now. And there's, it's a huge number of people and a relatively small amount of water, which makes it even more challenging. A lot of aquifers, so a lot of aquifers which also complicate yes. the issues. Thank you. Over here. Hi, I'm Mikhail Smilovic from McGill University, a PhD student. My question's for Carl. Say you want to do a story on the food, water, energy nexus in India or China. How do you start? Um, who are the superheroes you begin to talk to? <laughs> <laughs> I start here. Um, no, it's, it's, and that's a question we get asked a lot, is these stories are huge, they're complicated. Um, how do you eat an elephant? You start one, one bite at a time. And when we started looking at the water energy nexus or, or challenge in the US, we started with three stories. And we ended up doing 18. So journalists are, are short attention, well, our audience have shorter attention spans than we do. Um, but what we try to do is follow a scent. And so with China, we wanted to look at, in a sense, take our work in, in, uh, in the US a step further and say, what is this water energy nexus? What's it look like in China? in the world's fastest growing economy. And so the way we started is we brought together a diverse group of people um, from Chinese scientists, climatologists, researchers, experts. We convened in Washington. We said, what are the big questions if you could send a journalist, if you could send Tom Friedman from the New York Times out, what questions would you want him to ask? What are the important things that we're missing? And so that's where we start. And then we follow our noses from there. And you have to be open. You have to have a, a path. It's like, like traveling. You have to have a path, um, but then be open to serendipity. And also stick to, again, your, your main story core, which for this round was water and energy. And so now looking at India, you also have to factor in the food piece, because India is so tied. The farmers, it's the water, energy, food nexus, right there, the man outstanding in his field. And so how do you tie that together? So, to tie all these pieces together, connecting the dots, the data, whether it's pixels or stories, 
Um, what we're doing too is we're stepping back even a little further. We, we're connecting, the, we're doing these stories on the ground and then we've created a series called Global Choke Point. And so what we wanna do is, is ask a range of the same questions in the same places and then go deeper course, because we're going to find heroes, victims, and villains, and dramas, and the things that st great stories make. And we want to look at the world's challenges, and the world's really the hot spots of the emerging trends, and capture that information, capture the data, and then make the comparison. So we can start to get a little bit bigger, more holistic picture, systemic picture of what's happening. So I always tell people when they, when they come in with a huge project, and a, or it's an intern, and says, you know, I really want to tackle this. I say, how do I do this? And, and they, their story comes in at 6,000 words and wanders all over. I said, let's take it back to about 300 words. And let's just start there. Let's do a really good 300 words and figure out where that goes. So let me put, put you on the spot and say, if tomorrow morning you were starting to do three stories in Canada, where would you go? Boy, would I, you would, I would, uh, I think there, there are three stories that are, that are really ripe, ripe here, of course. There's, the big data story. Um, how is Canada going to tell, going to connect, connect the sensors? What's it going to learn? What do we know already? What don't we know? What are the big questions that are being asked now? So it's more of a process story, a setup. So how is Canada putting its ears in place, so to speak? And how is Canada going to manage that? And then also, what are the cultural uh, implications of, of having water, not having water? And there are challenges in, in the indigenous communities of having access to, to safe drinking water. Um, and then I'd look at the longer term trends. Um, I'd look at uh, particularly some border issues. Uh, I'd look at the Great Lakes as one, and then maybe uh, Alberta and uh, northern US, where it's, where it's also very dry and where we have a major energy play. So gee, there's probably four. Amazing, and I didn't even tell him I was gonna ask the question. That's great. <laughs> I practiced. Okay, over here. Hi, this is, um, I'm Erica from the Mi'kmaq Conservation Group, and I was actually just about to ask about, because I saw for Carl that you were going all over the globe, but that if you had ever done any work in First Nation communities in Canada, in Canada or North America, because a lot of First Nations, as you were just saying, um, fa are facing first, or third world challenges in terms of water and drinking water and having access to clean water for sanitation and health? Well, that's a great question. And I think you know, that comes back to how do, we, how do we even value or understand water in our own communities in the developed world? And so far, and I'll just put this from my own community in Northwest Michigan, oh, we have a water crisis? I can see the bay, you know, quite literally. I can see Lake Michigan from our office. And how do we, usually the water crisis is seen as a crisis over there. It's something that we send aid to, we help, we might go help drill wells or, or bring filters or you know, whatever technologies that are applied. But right now in the US, um, we have a slow burn. The US is already in drought. Um, our drought this summer may be more severe, is likely to be more severe than last summer. And last summer took a percent off the GDP. So who are the people affected by that drought? I mean, go to the Four Corners region in the US where they don't have safe drinking water and probably in many senses the um, communities haven't had safe drinking water for years. So how does this impact, how does this change that culture? How, how, can, how can the First Nations manage their water and be part of the conversation? That's a huge piece of the story. And a lot of First Nations around the world have also been great stewards of the water and great stewards of the land. And how can we learn from that and elevate that meaning? Because again, another, another moment with Beryl Carmichael in Australia, and it, it, sorry, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up, um, thinking about sitting in her kitchen. And again, it was this, um, this moment where we said, Beryl, you mentioned dream time. And she just glossed over it, dream time, this, and she, in, our, in our conversation. And I said, just tell me about dream time. And then literally I went over and put my foot on our cameraman, put my foot on our, cam our cameraman's foot so he wouldn't say anything. And so we just wanted to take her back to dream time. And then a minute goes by and she starts to cry. And she says, I've lost my dream time. I've lost my connection to 40,000 years of, an of ancestors because the river, the kookaburra is gone and the river is dry and I have no place to walk. Dream time is walking with your ancestors for her. So the huge cultural impacts, um, those stories are, are, are really moving and we can, learn, we can learn immensely from them. Thank you. 
Yes, the middle. Oh, sorry. Over here on the, on the left. Yes, yes hi. <coughs> my name's Reg Whiten. I'm a watershed steward, uh, ship planner, and agrologist based out of northeastern BC in uh, Dawson Creek. Also worked, uh, as we were talking over coffee break, on the Peel Watershed Land Use Plan, which encompasses a 67,000 square kilometer area. And my question goes to the idea of planning and protection. Um, you know, Flo Brentland talked about 12% uh, as a target for protected areas way back in the early 80s. And the focus was on mostly biodiversity. And I look at how plans have been implemented, integrated watershed plans and land and resource management plans. They're all economically driven plans. They're not, you know, you tag on a little bit of protection. And I'm just wondering in going forward, particularly in the territories where you may be shaping a new approach, that uh, the focus will be on uh, protection to a certain degree. Uh, in headwaters especially, protected areas, uh, there is such thing as no and go and no go and unacceptable risk or latent toxicity you talk about in, in, project, in development projects that already exist, the Faro Mine is examples in the Yukon. And I just wonder how far um, we may need to go in that direction in terms of you know, surface headwater protection and groundwater protection as a mandated initiative that Canada could lead on. And secondly, the topic of interbasin transfer. You know, it's not going to go away. We're seeing what's happening in the States, and interbasin transfer is, well, we got the pipes already running down there. You can change the gas to water pretty easily. So I'd like your comments on those two big themes. <laughs> Thanks. Minister. Thank you. The, uh, first, just a, a quick comment, if I may, on, on water. Up in the Northwest Territories, a, a little plastic bottle of water, about this much, would cost you over $3. The, uh, yet we give out licenses, water licenses to industry for hundreds of thousands of liters or cubic meters of water for basically the price of the administration to fill out the forms. So when we talk about the value for water, uh, what's it worth? Uh, it, it's a very tough question and when you talk about what the elders tell you in Australia or they'll tell you on any uh, reserve or wherever, wherever they live, how do you put a value, what dollar value can you put on that if you can? And, but you can't not value it and it's a very challenging issue. So the land use plans are critical. Uh, we're heavily involved in the protected area strategy. We have we're doing a, redoing our Wildlife Act. We're, we're looking at a land use sustainability framework. We've done our water strategy, all with an eye towards the land, the water, and the animals, and then the, making sure we keep that balance as we get pushed, and we want to look at economic development. And we have, as I indicated, some very glaring reminders that are right in our backyard every day. Giant mine, the old Pine Point mine, Port Radium, which was developed during World War II, where they left a terrible mess and uh, it's still not cleaned up to this day. So, and we have the pressures of climate change, global warming. A lot of our caribou herds have been in, in enormous distress. So all these factors come together and the push from our people is to take care of this. That we want you to take care of this. Yes, we want a strong economy, but not at the price of sacrificing the land that sustains us. So it is very important. Now, the middle. Uh, thank you. Uh, Irving LeBlanc, Acting Director for Housing and Infrastructure <clears throat> for the Assembly of First Nations and Infrastructure takes on all the areas of water and wastewater and other source water protection. I just have a, um, <clears throat> more or less a comment on, uh, on the presentations from the, from the panel and particularly um, um, the work that uh, Minister Miltenberger has been doing in the uh, Northwest Territories as representative of a, of a true model of co uh, collaboration and cooperation with uh, First Nations and Aboriginals, other Aboriginals in, in the territory. Uh, this is one of the areas that Aboriginal um, uh, um, AFN is really uh, uh, supportive and would like to see more of, of this happening in all the uh, the watershed management areas in Canada. <clears throat> There's some very good examples. One I like the best, uh, one, one of them I like is, is the work that David Marshall has been doing, the Fraser Basin Council, um, represents, um, uh, 
recognition of the four orders of government, and, and that includes First Nations. And really, um, that's, that is the right approach to, to start uh, any, any of that work. So we certainly um, would like to see more of that because uh, uh, probably we'll uh, hear later on uh, that um, um, this Canada is, is, is uh, covered uh, entirely by treaties and every one of the watersheds is in some, some treaty or traditional area. So I just want to bring up that point. Um, <clears throat> we really um, recognize the good work being done there and I'd like to see more of that happening. Um, in terms of um, water allocations, again, that's a big, uh, big uh, concern, especially out west in, in the first in time, first in right uh, you know, issues that they have. Certainly, look at uh, there was a brief mention about what's happening in the U.S. by one of the, uh, the people that stood up, uh, looking at the Winters Doctrine of recognizing First Nations prior rights to water, and certainly I think that's uh, something uh, we would be we should be looking at. Uh, just in, in terms of uh, your, your question, in terms of uh, uh, whether it would be the three pictures, and he touched on a little bit. Certainly, the uh, Winnipeg Free Press uh, did a uh, thorough expose of uh, First Nations conditions, in, especially in northern uh, Manitoba, the conditions of water and, and wastewater sanitation, uh, which is uh, basically third world conditions. So, uh, even in our backyard, uh, there, there's these conditions that. Uh, Certainly may not be as, as bad as in some of the areas that uh, water well, stressed areas in the world, but certainly we, we are there too. So just I want to point that out because I might not have another opportunity to, to bring it up, but I think this is a good place to bring it up. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hello, my name is Jose Miville de Chien, and oh, okay, and I publish the Water Chronicles at water.ca. Uh, my question is about transparency and is for Jeff. Uh, Data is good, but uh, I've come, we've been tracking boil water advisories for s six years now, and the difficulty is getting the information in some, in some instances. For example, um, all the good news is easy to, to access, but the bad news is always difficult. There's an open source, for example, in Ontario on water, but the small drinking systems are not included. And that's where all the problems are. So I'm wondering, as a data gatherer, and to get knowledge, how do we get over this political way of always getting a little bit untransparent? Great question. <clears throat> Pardon me, great question. And I, I wish there was a, a simple answer to that. Um, I was saying to somebody earlier that I feel like we are at the beginning of a new era in human existence and we are kind of in our infancy stage when it comes to information management where like something that was dropped down from the heavens, some new tool or resource and we're clumsy with it. We don't know what to do. We're just generating tons and tons of data and it's as much of a risk as it is an asset right now and I think it, it will take time but I think um, like every evolution or every technology or advancement in, in human society, um, the good will, will rise to the surface and we're seeing a lot of transparency now and a lot of exchange of data. We're seeing consortiums of private industries who held very closely their intellectual capital, their proprietary secrets are sharing that IP and that's unprecedented and that's, that's happening in, in Western Canada, for example, with the consortium of oil sands innovations. And uh, you know, it's, it's a very slow process, but it's uh, a terrific, a phenomenal uh, you know, and, and pivotal point in history to start seeing the, the curtain being pulled back. And you're right, the bad data is, is harder to access, but I believe that the pressure will mount for the good data to be brought to the surface and for this open data concept to, to you know, it will gain traction. Um, I think it takes uh, some courage from the people who have uh, some accountability for that data. You know, there's many ways to capture data and replicate data, and I believe the technologies will advance around that where we can tag the source or the origin of data uh, so that you can follow its, its lineage and trace it back to the source. 
I think that's important to give uh, governments and agencies and big cities the confidence to put that data forth so that it won't be used against them later uh, or twisted in some way so that it's uh, misconstrued. Uh, so that on a technological front, there's always going to be advances in that because it's such a big issue now. Uh, but organizationally as well, people need to embrace the fact that, and it's always been this way, of course, that's why we came together as communities uh, and villages, uh, you know, to our very exist, uh, you know, the very foundation of our existence was to come together and share information. So I believe that that, that change will take place, uh, but it's going to be a slow process. And again, because we're new, all these tech tools and techniques are new, you know, I, th I think the timeline is, is years and decades, to be honest. Level than at the business level, this lack of transparency. Um, do I think the lack of transparency is appropriate at, at any no, level? I think that it seems to be harder in politics for politicians to be transparent. Yeah. I probably have to take off my IBM badge here to, to say <laughs> this, but. Um, I think, and I'm stating the obvious by saying that we have to get out from living quarter to quarter and term to term and um, better information. It's like brighter headlights. It allows you to see further into the future. And we have to look at that super container of the environment and be able to talk in the language of, of investment, of business. And we do have to quantify those things that are previously or traditionally very hard to quantify. And as I tried to uh, highlight in my presentation that you can quantify a lot of things these days and you need to be able to do that to be able to have a proxy to say that you know the value of this forest or this watershed over a 30-year period is more than it is if we cut it down next year and uh, that's that's the power of you know better information um, yeah I think oh, can sorry, I add to that really ahead, quick um, I think one other piece to that too is that we all have in this new era we all have the opportunity and the responsibility to help put that data in context. And what we found in working in, well, in the U.S. and also particularly in China and India and other countries is that, um, well, some folks asked, how did you get your data? How did you get the information? And, and if, I'm, uh, if I'm feeling um, playful, I'll say we use the IWT process. And I go, really? What process is that? And it's I was there. And so quite literally, we show up because in some of these countries, some of these businesses, they keep three or four different sets of books and different sets of data depending on the audience. And so when you're able to show up and go put it in context and go look at the mine, go look at the steel mill and talk to the engineers, then you're able to put it, um, you know, you're able to add that reality to it. And then also sometimes, like I mentioned, the, the scientist in, uh, in China, Ningxia, China, Nobody had ever asked him for his data, and there hadn't been a place for him to put it. So now we have places to put this data and where people can share, comment, and then add different levels of trust to it. So it's, it's a really exciting time, but I think context is, is going to be key. For here. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Blair. I'm a graduate student at Dalhousie University. Uh, my question is for the minister. You talked a little bit about um, this idea of community-based approaches to water monitoring and management. And I'm actually wondering what sort of communities or how do communities go about um, managing and monitoring the water within the Mackenzie River? And then what sort of infrastructure is in place to facilitate data sharing and government sort of types of decision making um, that the government should or does facilitate? So we have 33 communities, and it's not only the Mackenzie, there's the Great Slave, and there's the Slave River, uh, the Liard as well. So we, uh, we started with our water strategy. We've made partnerships, engaged in partnerships with Wilfrid Laurier, Canadian Water Network. Uh, they've helped put money into a process to develop a community-based water monitoring system where you work with the communities, you train folks on the ground to read uh, and, and put all these uh, instruments into the water you uh, and, re and take the readings and, and share them. We have uh, worked with the universities, especially in the South Slave initially, to come in and work with uh, and show the, uh, the, the local people as they take fish out what to look for as, we, as they harvest the fish and they, they 
gut them and skin them and they take and they look and see to make sure that they're they're healthy so we've partnered up with angos we've got our thinking clear with the water strategy and we've we're training people in every in every uh, community one of the challenges is of course as was talked about earlier we now have reams of data coming to us and now we're struggling to find the resources so that we can in fact in, interpret the data do the trends and share the information back to the community so that they know that their work is being has value and it gives them confidence uh, at what the baseline is and if there's any changes so it's a work uh, it's a work in progress we struggle mightily with resources and we have we've learned the value of partnerships outside of government thank you Bob, uh, Bob Slater I'm uh, at Carlton University and I'm also closing the door finally on the National Roundtable on the Environment and Economy later this week. Um, my question is that, <clears throat> pardon me, 25 years ago, a new paradigm uh, was introduced that was sustainable development. And over that past 25 years, uh, there are two sectors that have exceeded expectations. And one is the community level, and the other one is at the level of multinational corporations. And one of the things I just want to concentrate on multinational corporations, which if you look at the 100 top or biggest economic players in the world, 50 are nation states and 50 are multinational corporations. So huge enterprises, massive power. And one of the things that's been realized over the last uh, 25 years is that no matter how powerful they are, they all need a social license to operate. So my question to you is, if multinational corporations need this social license to operate, what expectations do you have of them in the next 25 years? And how will that manifest itself, whether it's a multinational corporation operating in the Northwest Territories, a colleague multinational business for the private sector, or if you were trying to tell a story of how a multinational corporation can operate. Thanks, Bob. So, a, a specific question for each of you. So, just very quickly, the, what we have come to learn from our past is on a go-forward basis, I'll use the diamond mines as an example. We've we are, have a very significant diamond industry. And when they, they went through the process, they had to go through a fairly grueling environmental process. They had, to, uh, they had to negotiate impact benefit agreements with the Aboriginal government whose territory they were doing business in. And then as a territorial government, we as well had our negotiations with uh, the corp these corporations for socioeconomic agreements that spoke specifically in addition to all the conditions of their permits, what kind of employment opportunities, the, uh, using local businesses, growing local business, training opportunities, so that between us we've tried to capture to the best of our ability and improve upon uh, some of our history where the mines would come to town or development would come to town, they would extract the resources and leave and that would be it. So. We've, uh, we're working on, on that model as we go forward now up and down the valley and as we take on devolution and we take on these other authorities, we're going to be reviewing those, but those are the tools we use right now. I think, uh, this is a personal view again, I think that the successful private enterprises of multinational companies, especially large companies of the future, will, the smart ones, the ones that will survive will probably be the ones that are able to decouple revenue growth from natural resource extraction and utilization. I mean, we're pushing out the edges of the, the super container, as I keep calling it. Um, you know, there won't be enough uh, rare metals to make unlimited cell phones in the years to come. We're going to need to be able to repurpose and, and build in design for environment kind of concepts. Do more with less, do more with different. Um, you know, we're realizing that we've, we've, we're using up, what, 2.2 uh, planet Earths in terms of natural resource extraction. We're drawing down on the principle. We need to be drawing down on the, on the interests, and I think the smart 
sustainable, resilient, adaptable companies will embrace that because this um, paradigm or illusion of infinite growth uh, and marketplace dominance and superiority is, is I think is probably fading um, from reality because it's, it's not sustainable. And uh, so the, it comes back to you know, better usage or minimizing your, your resource extraction and decoupling that from, from uh, innovation and, and you know, financial performance. Wow, what a great story, though. Um, so here we have multinational companies around the world, and we have a great drama unfolding. We also we have heroes, we have victims, we have villains. Um, and which companies are which companies fill those shoes, and who's doing what? Another huge question to ask is which companies aren't playing at all? Which companies have not awakened to the the water or the resource risk um, that they face? Which ones are not disclosing that? And that, you know, journalists, we don't just tell stories, we also um, hold truth to power. Um, great reporting is, is using data to say, you know, here is the truth as far as we know. And so I think with, on the corporate side and also the government side, um, we, need to, we need to really raise the level of, uh, of competence in our, in our governments. Um, talking about, what did somebody say, a, uh, a, a beginning career politician was a conversation yesterday I had. How do we educate these people as they're setting water rates and, and uh, agendas for infrastructure for small communities? Um, so we have a huge drama. I think it's our role to, to kind of unpeel those layers and show who's doing what and who's doing what, why, and at what motivations. Thank you. Great question. And one over here. Hi. Um, I'm Tom McCauley, and I, I worked for the International Joint Commission for 12 years until last year. We handled transboundary water between Canada and the U.S., preventing and resolving disputes. <coughs> but my, my question is for Carl, and it's, it's something totally different and off the wall, and, I, and uh, it's about superhero training in development school. And uh, I liked your yes. theme. And, and I, I think that you're, you're an example of a superhero that went right. Uh, was it, it was Solzhenitsyn, I think, that said in one of his speeches that the line between good and evil goes through every human heart. And, and so when you, I mean, we can't divide people into heroes and villains and, and that although, but when somebody is sparked and they apprehend good and value in water, in the ecosphere, in this, in this earth and in other human beings. Uh, if they want to go further and they want to become a superhero, we also know that superheroes can do all kinds of damage and can go wrong and go, and go bad. And so the development I'm thinking of from an ego that wants to do good and to somebody that has enough humility to really be open to recognize and respect the human beings, each particular human being, each culture, uh, is an important road to travel for those superheroes who could either otherwise be creating all kinds of ruckus and, and problems and, and can actually get very discouraged when we look at climate change and when we look at what's happening. So they need a renewable resource within themselves to keep the hope up. So, just some comments about superhero tra training from you, Carl. <laughs> yeah, I actually have another, another technical term, and we call them action figures. <laughs> um, no, I mean, quite, I, I'm only half joking, because if you go to our website, there are people we run across every, you know, every day who are heroes in their own rights. They're, they're people working in the slums with uh, uh, making, sure, making sure HIV uh, victims have safe drinking water so their medications work. I mean, and so one of our goals is to also identify these action figures, people who are doing quiet things every day, and build that more into a network, build that into a connected network so that when we go back to India, we were talking about how do we tackle these stories, that we keep our Rolodex, our connective, our network of action figures so that when, we, when we're coming to a town, we know who people who can help us, um, and we can also help elevate them and also connect them so that they're not alone. Not everybody has to wear the, the blue spandex suit. Could I and add to that? And last question. Sorry, Elizabeth, I just yeah. wanted to add to Carl's comment there, and I love the superhero theme because we've, we've got one right here on stage, I guess, with us. And, uh, 
and, uh, and about making those connections. You know, it's those quiet people in far-flung corners of the earth who are doing incredible things. And when we filter out all the noise, and again, this point about the infancy of, of this time of life, when we, when we get better at filtering out all that noise and we can bring this to the surface, these stories of these superheroes, that gives us more time to engage in these kind of you know, appreciative inquiry and adaptive leadership and action research kind of methodologies that we know are so important. So it's a, a real team effort here, right, to identify those superheroes and, uh, and get their stories known and then try and suppress the stuff that's not really adding any value. So, thanks. Last question. Sorry. I'm, um, thank you. I'm Mark Longer. I'm a senior associate professor of education at International Christian University in Tokyo. Um, and Carl, you mentioned in your talk about the complexity of the issues and how in 300 words you have to um, grab readers' attention competing with trivial stories about uh, celebrities. And I, I would like to, I, I'm studying water literacy internationally. And um, I, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on what education systems can do better to equip um, mass populations of people with better knowledge about water? Should we, should we uh, infuse the curriculum with more about the relationship between water and the ground that contains it, or the, the food, energy, water nexus, or you know, across basins, international problems with water? Or do you have any um, tips for improving the readership uh, of your stories? Yeah, uh, the number one rule is to make it local and make it relevant and start there. So that if Mrs. Johnson's second grade class, if there's a, if there's a creek in the back uh, behind the playground, um, help them do a water project so that they understand where water comes from, where it goes, what lives in it, what it means if it's safe, um, if it's safe for the environment, safe to drink. Um, and then build those bigger connections. Um, I think what we really, really have to do is accelerate that process. Um, we can't wait another 10 or 15 years for it to make it through education system. We all have to play a role in that. Um, the model that, that we try to use in every story is combining great storytelling, um, whether it's 300 words or 30,000 words, with the science so we can test it so we're not just, we're not just becoming part of that clutter. Um, and then combine that with the data. What's the data telling us? Are we headed in the right direction or do we have to change our course and vice versa? And then the design piece, how do we communicate that? That's oftentimes where we fall down, is we do something great and we put it on white paper and we put it on the shelf. How do we push that out to different audiences? How do we share that? And I think the most important part all the way back around is the convening part. So when we have a great story to tell, when we have a new report, when we have a new set of data, when we have a challenge, let's bring the, let's bring the people together and let's roll up our sleeves with a an outcome-driven model. What do we need to accomplish? And let's figure out a path to get there. I mean, really, this is, I mean, this is a global water crisis. It may be unfolding slowly, and we may have to reach for our inflection points, those key moments. When those key moments occur, we want to have everything front-loaded so that we know what to say, and we can bring the right people together. And we have the right data in place, and we have the stories that really connect and make it relevant. I think it's a great question, and I think we do have to bake in those values at a very young age. I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, the next generation will consume whatever you put in front of them, and we have to, you know, take it upon ourselves to make sure that that is the, these important lessons and, and plans for the future are baked into the curriculum at a very early age. And if you look at the data, I mean, I think it was this morning I heard that there's a 1.5 million. Uh, jobs to be filled in Canada, skilled jobs, and we also have a surplus of graduate students. So it's, I think the term is job mismatch or something. And uh, so if you look at the data from around the world, other people are not having that problem. And uh, that play pump idea, what I try and convey when I show that is that, you know, we've got all the water here, but someone could, could eat our lunch. You know, if we're not uh, building this into uh, everything that we are, the, the value of this resource, then, uh, you know, we, we will slide down the list of the people, you know, the countries around the world, and we'll be water stressed uh, if, if we're not careful about it. So great, great point. You know, let's, let's teach them early. I think it's uh, another need for uh a role for a national water strategy where you could build in an educational component that everybody would be telling the same story 
to all our children and putting them uh, putting it into the schools but also making sure that uh, parents and families know uh, know the story as well thank you very much the the intent i think of the organizers this morning was to under the rubric of innovation cause us to start thinking differently and to hear from some people who have uh, both experience and expertise in bringing that thinking differently to the table. So we've heard mind-numbing statistics, uh, as we always do in the water field. Um, we've heard about emerging technologies that have such potential to help us uh, maximize and optimize uh, information and data that we have. And we have uh, an example of, uh, of a political figure who understands that uh, there is a very important role for government to play in making this all happen. It seems to me, and, and this may, may be my particular spin on it, that uh, one of the advantages of thinking about innovation and thinking about real systems thinking is that it causes you to spend some more time thinking about the human being and how one actually brings about behavioral change. Because you can have the technology, you can even have the rules on the books. You can monitor so you know more, but ultimately the, the bottom line question is, so what? So what are you going to do about uh, what you've learned and what that information is? And until we start to really understand how to bring about attitudinal and behavioral change, uh, we haven't really hit the nail on the head in terms of finding those successes that we're really aiming for. Thank you so much to uh, our three guests who've got us, uh, I hope uh, you'll agree, started uh, thinking differently. Um, I wish you all the very best in the, uh, in the next two days and the, and the conversations to come. And I hope you'll keep coming back to some of the wisdom you heard from uh, these individuals this morning. So please join me in thanking them for uh, opening this conference to such a great start. Thank you.